Next, I'd like to ask Ustaz Hisham Abdullah to... Uh, Ustaz Hisham, you are a teacher of many activists in the Muslim community, including my teacher. I have learned a lot from you. Uh, you give lectures on Tarbiya and on many important topics. Can you please address what should be the attitude of the Muslims in the face of, of a Trump presidency? How should we be acting? Yes. Um, we, I mean, as, as Muslims, we always have to be reflective. And we have to always ask the question, why? And not why in the sense of the mechanics of why. The Democratic Party had a, a bad candidate and they refused a the better candidate early on. And, and we can go on and on and on and everyone will have, you know, their own analysis of why we ended up here. The why I'm talking about is, why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed this to happen? And then we reflect. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us, and I don't have you know, the time to go over the, the, the evidence from the ayat and the hadith and so on, that anything that we dislike that befalls us, there has to be a blessing in it. Invariably. With it, not after it. Inna ma'al usri yusra, ma'a. You know ma'a, right? It, with it, it comes, not after it. Inna ma'al usri yusra. That it is coming, th there must be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is it, if we have to assume that among us, inshallah, there are people who are sincere. I hope all of us, but at least many of us. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is somehow bringing us closer to Him and to His cause. Because Allah, you know, I, I had, there's so many things in, in my mind I want to share with you. For example, I had a brother saying, uh, you know, that, that it, why, 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 is this, why is this happening? And I said, you have to look at yourself, you have to look at the community, and you have to look at... And someone was saying, I'm really afraid, not for myself, I'm, I'm retired and I'm in my 70s now or whatever, I mean, I don't have much time, but I'm afraid for the future of Islam in this country. And my response to him, the future is not yours, the future doesn't belong to you, this, this Islam doesn't belong to you. This is Allah, Allah's, Allah's, Allah's deen, Allah's message. He's the one who's running this show. And that's step number one is this is Allah's plan. I have to look for the wisdom behind it and I have to make the best out of it so that the, the outcome inshallah will be positive for myself and my community and to, to submit to, to this, this will of Allah at that level, right? Do all the analysis you want, do all the planning you want, but deep down, don't think an imam will come in the khutbah and say, you know, you may dislike something and it's actually good for you. So he's trying to kind of uh, appease you or, or kind of alleviate your, your anxiety. So no, he's telling you exactly what it is. This is, this is, the, this is the bottom line. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that anything that befalls the Muslim, whether something he, or the, the mu'min rather, any, anything that is good or bad is, is in the end is good for him or her. So we, we have to ask ourselves why. And, and the why may be that we have been, actually there are so many things that are missing from our, our priorities as, as American Muslims. I spoke this morning about how we have not stood up for the weakest and for the most oppressed and for the most underprivileged in this country. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us with this big event that we must actually stand with the oppressed. I remember, for example, when, when, when I remember when 9-11 happened, I remember very clearly, you know, it's one of those moments that you remember exactly where you were, you were sitting in your car or you were sitting at home or you were on the phone or whatever. The first meeting of the mass executive committee with the, well, was, was, was then, you know, a couple of days after September 11, and everybody was brainstorming what we should do. The first thing that came out of my, my mouth, after, of course, the, the analysis and the spiritual part and all that, is outreach. Outreach, that this September 11, now if we don't outreach, 
If we don't reach out, we're going to be extinct. We're going to be, you know, we can actually go and, and anything can happen to us. The first thing that came to mind in this year is unite and coordinate. Unite among Muslims and coordinate with others. I have to say, you know, that, that, that anyone who, who does an, an evil plot or something like that, whatever you want to call it, they, they're, there's some element of stupidity always there. And the element of stupidity of what we've witnessed here is that this, this Trump campaign antagonized so many communities. Immigrant communities, Mexicans in particular, Muslims, gays and lesbians, immigrants, Jews. And you, you, I, I wouldn't imagine that anybody would like, after all what the Jewish community has done and, and really established themselves in this country, that somebody would be so dumb to actually say, we're not racist, but we hate Jews and we support Trump. I mean, it's so dumb, right? So we have to, we have to, to leverage this. Our attitude should be optimism because it must be good for us. We will learn how as, as time passes and as we analyze more. And it must be an attitude of reaching out, uniting and coordinating with, with other communities. We can't do this alone. Allah. Next, we would like to call on Brother Mujahid Fletcher. I know you are an activist in, in the community and you have uh, set up several organizations. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and help us address how we should move forward. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Jaime Mujahid Fletcher. I accepted Islam three months before September 11th. And I'm originally from Colombia, South America. Alhamdulillah. I'm very thankful to Allah first and foremost for being part of this panel. I believe that this community that I have joined after my conversion is a community that I possibly didn't understand or even knew of before I actually studied Islam for one year when I was 23 years old. And when I became Muslim, I realized that all the Muslims were not the Sahaba that I read about. You know, when you're not Muslim and you read about the seed of the Prophet I was studying Tafsir and Quran in the Arabic language when I wasn't Muslim. From a Sheikh in Houston, Texas. And I asked all the questions necessary in one year to the point that when I became Muslim, he said, you should choose the name Mujahid because you struggled to find the truth so much. And I did this with all the different religions, by the way. Why I mentioned this about myself is because there are so many Americans, such as myself. The unique part about my conversion story in August of 2001 is that my father, who was an agriculture engineer from Colombia, asked me for some information in Spanish about Islam. And when I went to Dar es Salaam with some other publishers, I realized there were three books in the Spanish language, and they were all by different authors, but one title, The Five Pillars of Islam and The Six Pillars of Faith. And that was it. He read one book, and we ran out. 2001. So he said, you know, if Muslims were in Spain so long, they didn't write books. They were there like 800 years. And my father's educated. And he was an educator. He was an instructor at a national level in Colombia. I realized that the Muslims lacked a certain amount of communication with people like us. And I was from this society, right? But nevertheless, I said, okay, let's go to the mosque and I'll translate for you in the back. And we used to sit in the back and I used to translate for him because his English wasn't 100%. And one day, when we had a panel of speakers, my father said, the way that these people speak should be the speech of the leaders of the, of the world. And I said, how so? He said, it's based on peace. And I said, what do you not like about Islam? And he said, everything I've seen has left me clear in the doubts that I had about religion all my life. 
Bear in mind this man when I was growing up. I asked him about God. He said, all I know that there's one God. You find your truth because I'm seeking mine. So I grew up with an open mind and I searched all the different religions and so did he. That day when he told me that, I said, won't you accept Islam? Why won't you accept Islam? He said, I will. What do I have to do? So I walked up and the imam that was speaking that day, I said, my father wants to become Muslim. He said, you give him shahada. He gave me the microphone and so my father was the first person that ever took shahada with me. 50 alhamdulillah. He was 57 years old. And he looked at me and he said, if there's no material in Spanish, then you're going to have to make it. You heard that? MashaAllah. <laughs> MashaAllah. And you never think you're the one, right? You never think you're the one, right? It's someone else. Well, if somebody else didn't do it, why me? Who am I? And that's how we all think. And maybe I had these thoughts, but then September 11th happened. And that locked it. Because in Houston, Texas, where we're from, there's 150,000 Muslims at the time September 11th happened. But they had no one to represent the Muslims in front of Univision and Telemundo in the Spanish language. And they wanted answers. So the Muslim community asked me if I could speak in front of the media, and I was three months old in Islam. <laughs> How much does a three month old Muslim know? But I said yes. Because, as the Shaykh mentioned, with difficulty comes ease. And we learned that even though I was a new Muslim. And I said, there's got to be something good here. Maybe this is the time to educate the people about what we didn't know. And alhamdulillah, when we spoke in front of the media, it opened up the doors. Fast track to now, 15 years later. This year, January 30th of 2016, we opened up the first Spanish-speaking Islamic center in the United States, the New South Texas. <laughs> this facility has a museum in it, as soon as you walk in, with the arcs of Cordoba, from Alhambra. In between there, there are contributions of Muslims to civilization, in mathematics, in algebra. The first university, degree granted university in the world was set up by a Muslim woman in the year 859 in Fez, Morocco, al qarawi So the notion of Muslim women can't get an education, when they see that, it takes that away. We have a masjid where we deliver the khutbah 20 minutes in Spanish and 10 minutes in English. The only one in the whole United States. We have a lounge area where people can sit down and drink coffee and water and discuss and talk to one another. Because see, as Americans, we grew up socializing. We just socialized over drinking liquor though, right? That's how people go to happy hour after they get off of work on Fridays. And so when we become Muslim, we don't have these social spaces because when we go to the mosque, it's only a prayer area and then there's nowhere to socialize. So the youth and the new Muslims feel somewhat marginalized and disenfranchised. And some of them are going to the social areas where the majority of society is, the happy hour and all of this. And we're losing the youth, right? And a lot of the, non, the new Muslims go back. So we made this place, a place where people can come and speak to one another but the unique part about this, and where I want you to kind of get an idea as to why 15 years later we built this place, is because we have built everything upon the notion of media production. I am a producer. I had to go to school for multimedia and film because in order for me to produce material, I had to learn, right? My father told me you should produce this medium. We knew in the future it wasn't going to just be about books. It was going to be about audio and video. So I and my wife, who had, she embraced Islam a week after me, we are married a month after. Alhamdulillah, she, she graduated with honors from the Art Institute of Houston, and I graduated with honors. We were the youngest couple, we were the only Muslims in that school studying media, and we were about 20 something years old, young, you know, somewhat. And when we graduated, we knew we wanted to set out to do something, so we built an organization called Islamic Spanish. The organizations to educate Latinos about Islam in the Spanish language. We've, we've 
recorded the first audio of Quran in the, in the Spanish language from Fatiha all the way to Surat al Nas. 40 Hadith al Nawawi, many of the classical works. But more importantly, during the process of producing this, we distributed it all over the world. And we've been able to film and record and build up an audience to where right now, what's happening right here, we're on Facebook Live. We are reaching weekly on our Facebook page, 40 to 50,000 people weekly. And, and our website reaches 30,000. So on average weekly, we reach about 70 to 80,000 people. That's the new age impact. In this community, when I became Muslim, didn't value media. Until this day, 15 years later, it's amazing that I don't think it's valued. But you know the Central Islamic code, the Islamic Spanish Central Islamic code, this place we just built, we have cameras where we control it through remote control, we have a production studio inside. It's the only place that I know in America has a production studio. And they're you know, and delivering the khutbah, and it's all over the world that people see this. So what happens? We're able to educate more people than we can fill up conventions. 80,000 people a week. So what can we do, brothers and sisters, regarding our situation right now? This is not new. If, we, if you look at Al-Andalus, when the Muslims were thriving in Spain, there is a scholar by the name of Ibn, Ibn Khaldun. He wrote a book called Al-Muqaddimah in the year 1377. And he wrote about something called the Asabiyyah, which in these days is translated as social cohesion. He lived out with, in the desert with tribes and he observed how they preserved their identity and how they survived. And he realized in a four-year sabbatical, as he wrote by observing them, that when you're a minority, you have to come together to protect one another. That's the only way that tribes used to survive in the desert. But then he realized that when they went into the cities, they had to deal with the dynasties, the majority class. And so they usually took an individual from their tribe and said, you have to go in you know, with the dynasty and represent us, right? You be part of the government, you see? And so then that individual would be launched by his group and he spoke on behalf of their people. And then the next generation came and that individual that was now in a position of power began to not really have the asabiyya, the social cohesion he used to have with his tribe because now he's in a different place. And he's only looking at what the advisors are telling him. And then the next year comes in, by the third generation, his own tribe sees that he's not representing them anymore. And by the fifth generation, a new group of minority come and place their spokesperson in there. And then it starts all over again. Brothers and sisters, as Muslims, do you know that Ibn Khaldun, with this notion of Asabiya, if you get any sociology book, and you look at the history of sociology, he is categorized as the father of sociology. A Muslim. And this is a science that we study nowadays. As a, as a Latino, I'm a minority in America. Right? Latino is an ethnic minority. We are about 55 million, they say, in 2014 from the Pew Research Center, about 17% of the population. Muslims, we're a, re we're a religious minority, right? Which they say about 1% of the population, 2%. And then being a Colombian from Colombia, I'm a minority within the Latinos. Hmm. Colombians make up 2% of Latinos. Majority Latinos, Mexican, Puerto Rican, and so on. And then I'm a Latino Muslim convert. Converts are 25% of the Muslim community. I'm the only convert here, right? MashaAllah. And it's how many of us? Five of us? Okay, so it's a little bit less ratio. So what happens is this. I personally represent a minority within a minority within a minority within a minority. Quadruple minority. And what that means is, which there's a book, actually, called The Creative Man. And it's about people who become minorities within minorities. The only result that you get 
is someone who has a very unique point of view that many from amongst the majority cannot see. And nowadays, if we utilize the media in the way that we can, we're able to let people know who we are. And if you and I don't tell our own story, we're going to have to be defending other people's wrong story about us. So we work to negate instead of proactively explain who we are. And this is where the majority of the problem lies within our community. And I'll just end with this, brothers and sisters. There's an amazing study by Dr. Lara Dotson. She's called it the triple bind. It talks about how the demonization of Islam in America has played a specific burden on Muslim converts of diverse backgrounds, cultural backgrounds. Because the majority may be Indo, Pakistani, Arab, uh, you know, African countries. So what happens is that there is a political and social backlash specifically towards those classes such as a Latino Muslim. Because you get a three-tiered alienation or marginalization. You are socially marginalized from your own Latino people because they think you became an Arab. You left them. Okay? Your own family. My mother thought I was brainwashed when I became Muslim. What? You're not going to drink anymore? You're not going to go out? You're not going to deal with girls? What, are you crazy? And I said, that's what you've been wanting me to leave all my life. <laughs> and now I became Muslim and I'm crazy. So even your own family has to then see who you are now as a Muslim. Then you're politically dis uh, disenfranchised because so many of the Americans have this view of kind of suspicion or anti-immigrant sentiment in the whole discourse of Latinos and immigration. It's like 20 something years old, right? We've been dealing with this longer than what the Muslim community is about to embark upon. And it's interesting that the Muslims are not taken from the 20 years experience of the Latino community, which we should. And third, religiously, from the immigrant communities, brothers and sisters, and I just want to utilize that, that word just to make it simple and easy. The majority group from, from, from the Muslims in the Masajid, whether it's Indo-Pakistan, Arab, Indonesian, Bos Bosnia, you guys come from another country where the majority of population were Muslims. I don't come from a Muslim country. I come from Colombia, South America another non-Muslim country in the Western Hemisphere, in Latin America, and I'm from the West, with non-Muslim background totally. My last name is Fletcher, by the way. Five generations back, my great-great-great-grandfather five generations back was British. A white British man, European. My name is Jaime Mujahid Fletcher. So there's this mix of diversity from amongst Latinos, but religiously, when we become Muslim, we become a minority within the Muslim community. Therefore, my voice on this very panel is so underrepresented in every single convention that we have to build coalitions, even from amongst the Muslims. And that's why we came here from the city of Houston, Texas, and we hope, bin ta'ala, that we all come together to make America what we want to make America. Because don't ever think someone can make America other than what you want it to be. Because then you will be disenfranchised, you will be, de you will be demotivated, and you will feel as if you're at the mercy of someone else. And that's not the attitude of the Muslim. The attitude of the Muslim is that you have Izzah, you have honor. You are implementing this beautiful deen of Islam in this land, and only by your Islamic identity, if we really live it out, can we serve the people. And that's what the American public wants. And if we do that and just be Muslim, well, alhamdulillah, we can make America what we want it to be. Barakallahu feek. Jazakumullah khairan, Brother Mujahid, for this wonderful uh, description of your journey your philosophy on outreach. Um, there are five or six more questions that I would like to present to the panel. Maybe if each of you can try to, everyone doesn't have to answer every question, but feel free to step in for whichever question you want. But please, well, I said three minutes, we got 10 minutes, so now I'm gonna say one minute. Maybe we'll get two minute answers. Yeah, no, no, we'll say one minute. 
But uh, le let me quickly summarize a few key points that I think our esteemed uh, uh, speakers have spoken about. The first is the issue of belonging. We belong in America. We are not going to allow anybody to make us outsiders. So that's an important point that I think several of, of, of the, uh, in fact, all four of you have touched on this. A second point that I think several of our speakers have spoken about is, look, we need to be optimistic, not fearful. We need to be outward looking, not inward looking. Okay, and then we have talked about the individual roles. And, and Jazakallah Khair for Brother Hussam who said, explain this concept that look, we cannot be as effective if we are lone wolves. We have to individually join a political party. And you don't have to join his political party. You can join the other political party. In fact, we need Muslims in the Republican Party and the Green Party and the Libertarian Party. Okay? In any case, a person must be, we need Muslims at, in every table. So, so this is very important. We would like, uh, and, and I really want to, this is my opinion, I, I really want us to understand this. So if I am a Democrat, which I am, and if I run into a Republican Muslim, I don't need to treat him like the enemy because he is not the enemy. He's, a, he's my brother. We, we have a slightly different political philosophy. This is an important concept to understand. My enemy is the one who wants to marginalize Islam. And that person could be in my party or in the opposing party. That person is my enemy. But my brother who sees things differently, I don't have to fight him. Understand that, so for example, in the Minnesota delegation, we had, we had by the way, Minnesota had the largest number of Muslim delegates to the convention this year. We had nine, okay? Seven of us were Bernie delegates, two of us were Hillary delegates. Okay, so then somebody came to me and said, are we gonna do something about these two Hillary delegates and are we gonna force them to change their minds? I said, no. What happens if Hillary gets the nomination? Now we need a spokesperson inside that camp. This is a good thing. So, so we need to understand that the person on the other side of the table today may be your ally tomorrow. I've seen these Muslims attacking each other in a very unhealthy way. This is not good. I would like to give every individual person in this room an assignment. Within the next six months, I would like you to meet four elected officials. Your city council member, your mayor, your representative, your senator, your police chief, it doesn't matter who. This, we, this isolation business is done. We need to get out of this. Join a party, go attend a fundraiser for a political candidate you can support. So, but they're all thieves, brother, they're not all thieves. Yes, there are some good people who find the good ones and support them. Right? And also, you need to host a political fundraiser for a candidate of your choice, at least once a year. Try to become a party officer. By the way, most of these parties are desperately looking for anybody with energy. If you show up, you might become chairman. And this actually happened. Is that, is that a true statement? This is a true statement. So, so I, I want the Muslims to be thinking in this way. Now, I want to ask to my esteemed panelists, uh, a few questions. Question number one, what should be the role of every masjid? So many of us here are involved in different masjids and community organizations. Can you give us a list of tasks or to-do list or ideas for every masjid or community organization to do that is valid within their legal status that they can do? Who would like to do that? Start with, with one idea. Uh, but before that, by the way, I'm a Democrat as well, and then I used to ask my brothers in, and sisters in the Republican Party to repent, to make tawbah, <laughs> and leave their party. But I've, I'm going to stop doing that because I agree with you, we need Muslims in, in the Republican Party as well. 
so the, 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 the one thing I want, I, I want us as a Muslim community to be deserving of the mercy and the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That will not happen if we don't stand up with the oppressed. Any organization, whatever you are, if you are an, a grassroots organization, if you are a masjid, if you are a relief organization, if you are a, 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 an advocacy organization, whatever that, that, that type, part of your core agenda should be standing up with the oppressed, standing up with the weak, standing up with the underprivileged, with the poor, with the needy, with, with the disadvantaged, anything. That is, to me, I, I loved it when Imam Jihad yesterday was talking about Practical theology, that is practical theology. That's the application of our aqidah in, in, in real life. We must do that. Do not expect the help from Allah to come to us when we are turning a blind eye to the oppressed. Other than ourselves. And the Prophet, I can go on and on, I will not, but don't, don't worry if I said. But the, the Prophet وسلم, in Mecca, in the middle of all the persecution and all the oppression, that he and the Sahaba were, were exposed to, he was standing up for the oppressed as well. And I can, if you meet me outside, I can tell you the story. Inshallah. So, I mentioned that when I became Muslim, I saw that this community maybe, I, I didn't know too much about it. When I first spoke in the media, they were like, how come your community has never come and spoken to us? and churches as well. Um, so I said, I don't know. <laughs> I just became part of this community and I'm wondering the same thing. Um, as the brother mentioned, we, we, we have to get away from the issue of isolation and I don't even know what that means because I, I came up in this society. I don't know what it means to be isolated. I only found that out when I became Muslim. I saw people who were isolated and that um, maybe I didn't know the Muslim community before September 11th, but when I was entering Islam, others were uh, taking off the hijab and uh, cutting off their beard and wanting to be accepted. In America, you don't have to act to be accepted. Like, uh, like you want acceptance. You actually have to live out the American principles and people will want to respect you. If you do things for others just for yourself, as the, the Shaykh mentioned, right? MashaAllah, you stand with the underprivileged. But you don't stand with the underprivileged for your own well-being. You stand with the underprivileged for their well-being. You see how that works? Because when I became Muslim, I saw a lot of open house. MashaAllah, all over. Hey, invite your neighbors and all that. And I thought that went on all the time. But then whenever everything calmed down, it didn't happen anymore. And then something happens on the news, on the media, and all of a sudden the Muslims wake up. And then they go back to sleep. But now, mashallah, for four years, maybe they'll be awake for four years now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I just like to mention that, you know, assimilation is the extreme of what we don't want. We don't want to just be like everyone. America is not about you just melting in a pot. That's one extreme. You, and that's where we're losing our youth. They want to be just everything that's out here in the environment. You don't want to segregate. You don't want to only be amongst your own people and get you know, away from the people that are around you and live in bubbles. The Islamic perspective is to integrate, meaning that you keep your own values, qualities as a Muslim and you share that with the rest of society and you interact with people based on who you are. And that's how you add value to America, because America is built on diversity. And we have to believe that, and we have to live that. No, exactly. Just briefly to add to what the other esteemed speakers and brothers mentioned. I would say for every masjid specifically, not just any other organization, the masjid, Every message should be very familiar with city council members, including the mayor. Every one of them should invite them. Have them address the community, whether it's after Jum'ah or have a special town hall, open, open town hall meeting with the community. Invite various ones. Have them discuss some of the issues. Invite the chief of police. Host some events where we, you allow for that engagement. Every message should be very familiar with the local 
churches and synagogues, the progressive ones, the ones that are not anti-Muslim basically, should be very familiar with them, inviting them, uh, attending some common events. I'm not talking about theology. This is, we should be, move beyond theological discussions. That could be done academically, could be done with the imams and the pastors. I'm talking about what can we do together for the common good. So if we can get the Muslims, the Christians, the Jews, the Hindus, the, the Sikh, the Buddhists together to feed the homeless in the area. And I'm personally, I'm, I think we should be beyond just feeding the homeless. That is good, but we should stop thinking that this is where it stops. I'm going to ask you very specifically, how many of us as masajid and as individuals are willing to stand for the rights of others? As my dear brother Mujahid said and uh, Sheikh Dr. Hisham said, for the sake of the community. How many of us are willing to be in a protest to stand by our African-American brothers and sisters in the face of police brutality? Right? Let's, let's do it. Uh, Latinos, yeah, actually any, any brown people. And, and <laughs> how, many, how many of us, not just when it's discrimination against Muslims, when their young men are being targeted, specifically their young men, on petty crimes and sometimes even no crimes, entrapments. How many of us are going to be willing to be participating in protests to defend families whose loved ones are being deported now? Whether they were here documented or undocumented, there, there's a reality. We have 40 plus million people here. I'm not calling for people breaking our laws, but the reality is they're here. And they, when they came here, they brought some young people, children with them, who had no choice about being here. Is it fair to destroy their families now? Is it fair to penalize them, not giving them right to education? Because their parents brought them against their will when they were two year old or one year old or five year old. We have to be willing, not just to say we're expecting people to stand by us. So as a masjid, as institutions, but the masjid are a reflection of us. If we're willing to stand up for the rights of people, to stand for human rights. Again, laws are laws, but the reality behind these issues and incidents are people, people like you and me. People have reasons why they left their country. We're not calling for breaking of laws. Again, I'm saying some people fled because of persecution. They couldn't apply for asylum. And whatever the reason is, we need to deal with each case on a human level. So I'm calling on, on, on us moving beyond the feeding the homeless. That is good. But we need to talk about equal pay. We need to talk about minimum wage, livable wage, like the living wage. I know, mashallah, Muslims in general are more successful than others. But are we willing to stand by the workers in America, in our areas, who demand a pay that is decent, that they can raise their families in decent ways, where they can pay for their rents? We, we don't feel these, at least many of us might not feel when we live in certain cities and certain areas. But if you are expecting that Allah's blessings will come to us, it has to be when we're doing something good, standing for justice. So we're doing things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help others. Because we hope at the end of the day, inshallah, we don't do it for that reason, but we hope that because of that, hasana, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will soften the hearts of other good people to come to our aid when we're unjustly treated. I am one of the fortunate to be the president of the Moss Foundation in Chicago. Those who are familiar with Chicago and the Moss Foundation, they know who I'm talking about. Alhamdulillah, by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have almost 4,000 people on our Jum'ah. 25,000 people for our Eid prayer. Donald Trump contacted us, want to come to our Eid prayer to speak to Muslims. And we said no. The key issue, brothers and sisters, is about who we are. We could be in a small masjid, we could be in a big masjid. That does not change the fact and the reality that we are Muslims at heart. And if we are Muslims at heart, then we need to nourish our values. The mission of the Prophet وسلم, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described him, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Right? Not only رَحْمَةً لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ or رَحْمَةً لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ 
He said, Rahmatan lil alameen. And Allah knows there will be believers and non believers. There will be good and bad. There will be grateful and ungrateful. There will be munafiqeen and will, uh, there will be good hearted people. He said, lil alameen. We have a message. We have good things to offer. We cannot sit down and be a recipient of sympathy, of support from others, of passion from others, without reciprocating. As a matter of fact, without taking the initiative. Because we had a mission. Brothers and sisters, we are fortunate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chosen us from millions of our people back home who were dire to come to this country and could not get a visa. We got a visa. Not by the embassies, but by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come to this country if we use the purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us for, then we get the reward of it then we are at a place where we get the most of reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give people. If we miss this opportunity, all we gain is McDonald's. That's all we get from it. Or Burger King. The American style. In and out. In and out, okay. That's all. In and out. There's really nothing out of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we get McDonald's the headquarters there. So, brothers and sisters, we have a mission, and therefore our message should be the connection place. Alhamdulillah, in our message, we work with other groups and an organization. It is one of the largest community organizing in the nation. And we do joint work with them about health care, affordable housing, assisted living, assisted living for those who are handicapped that they need access to their homes. We convert those homes to become accessible to those who are physically challenged. We work on rehabilitation of neighborhood who've been hit by the real estate crisis. We work on gun violence. Now we are working on criminal, criminal justice. You know how many people have been shot because they had mental illness. They could not get access to their medication and the police thought that they were criminals or acting for, for some criminal activities and actually they were not. They were just looking for medication and been shot because they did not know that that person needed help, did not need a shot. And we're working with these groups together and they love to see Muslims with them. We do good for goodness sake. Right now, with the rise of Islamophobia and anti-immigration and anti-Semitism, we have to stand for the rights of everyone. We should send a message to everyone that we as Muslims, regardless and irrespective of what others did to us, we will stand on the high moral ground and we will do what is right because that's our Prophet وسلم, teaching to us and we are the followers of the best for mankind. And we have to deliver the best message that he has given to us. With the rise of anti-Semitism, we will send a message that we will be against anti-Semitism as much as we are against Islamophobia. And we will stand with the Latino immigrants as much as we stand with the Syrian immigrants. And we will stand with Black Lives Matter and the indigenous Native Indians, as much as we stand for our own people back home or over here, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us one good ayah. 
ولا يجرمنكم شنآل قوم على ألا تعدلوا اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى We stand with others even if we have some differences with them but this is the right thing and we do the right thing because it is the right thing to do and that's who we are and we will continue to be like that so brothers and sisters the role of your masjid should illuminate with these values that the Prophet Sallallahu has embodied and taught us and want us to be the true followers of his and we cannot do this without stretching our hands and reaching out to the others this is the time this is the time that we need it the brother said we have people here who hate us we have people who support us those who hate, who hate us we always know they will you just open on Fox News and you'll hear it all the time for many 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 years but what's different now when you listen to CNN all you hear is defending Muslims nowadays all the time you're talking about how they're going to do to this to Muslims how they're going to do this to Muslims Inna Allah amanu. keep that in mind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send someone to defend you as long as you hold on to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and that is Ni'mat al-Islam Thank you.